Welcome back. It is the Flow Friday Sports Show here on Flow FM. And Amy Riley now joins me from the Hume Netball League. We've got a bit to chat about, including last weekend's results. But more pressingly, we're going to talk about the pathway for women's sport in her area, particularly at a grassroots level. Amy Riley, great to have you back. How are you? I'm great, Alice. It's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure to have you. Now, I'm really keen to chat about this with you. You're certainly passionate about it. The investment going into women's sport, the Riverina area, in many ways sort of leading the push on this from a pathways and development point of view. Uh, We're talking about football and netball on a sort of level path. Um, Women having the opportunity to, if not play one of them, probably play both of them if uh, they're able to juggle it and, you know, if they're sort of athletic enough and fit enough to do it. And uh, it's great to see that we've got a lot of government money going into both codes for women. What do you make of the general landscape at the moment? Because three weeks ago we had news of the Ganmain Gorongrong Matong Lions receiving $1.7 million or just a touch over their football team in the area. And also I know that there's a lot of money going around in in the Hume Netball League. So just bring us up to speed on those updates as far as investment goes. Absolutely. So firstly, it is fantastic to see local, state and federal governments alongside the associated boards and industry bodies putting money towards the local pathways for our girls. Football, netball, regardless of the code, it's great to be able to encourage young people to be involved in sport. We know that for physical, mental health, social development, creating a community, it's so important for kids to remain involved in sport as they get older and throughout their adulthood. Certainly, Dan Main Grong Grong has been sensational for them to receive that $1.7 million grant. And absolutely, there has been a lot of infrastructure that's been going on in the Hume League in the last few years. And I know in the next 12 months, there are several clubs that are starting redevelopment on joint football netball or just netball facilities as well. So those sorts of priorities and putting first the player safety and health, which is a lot of what the updating of facilities, be them courts or club rooms, is around, is integral to be able to keep people involved in sport and developing them to come through our clubs and potentially move on to the likes of your Suncorp Super Netball or the Victorian Leagues and those sorts of pathways. All right, from the club circles that you're in, can you give us an idea as to how these funds are going to be utilised? We know that probably in this day and age, you know, um, relaying surfaces and just some of those uh, pivotal things are probably costing a lot more than what they used to. So how do you make this money, uh, I guess, stretch out in the best way possible? Safe and equitable access is a big focus that is going on in a lot of grants at the moment, particularly for the ones in the Hume League. I know that a lot of the focus has been around ensuring that the club rooms and the facilities that are being provided are up to scratch for modern day building codes and requirements. Some clubs have, you know, a hundred plus girls that are active in that club and ensuring that they're catering appropriately to them. They have separate change room facilities, disability access and all ability toilets are really important this day and age. We want to ensure that with our clubs, volunteers, participants come in all shapes and sizes and we want to make sure that everyone is welcome and everyone is able to use the facilities in a welcoming manner. And just finally, on the topic of uh, dual uh, representation across both codes for some individuals, how prevalent is that? How across it are you in terms of seeing players who are dabbling in both? And then obviously if they're good enough, I guess the the conundrum becomes which one do they choose in the end? Certainly there are quite a few girls, to my knowledge, throughout the Hume League, Talangata League and O&M that also participate in the AFL North East Border and they also participate in the Wagga League and other surrounding women's football. So the women's football is often played on a Friday night or a Sunday. So if the trainings work out, there are quite a few girls that play both. It's fantastic for me. I mean, I grew up playing football and netball and we unfortunately didn't have the women's league locally. Then I played in Wagga. 
But the ability to be able to not have to choose a sport and play both is excellent. And then, as you mentioned, if, if the ability for them to progress further happens, sometimes they do have to make a decision if they're looking at going to Melbourne, if they're going somewhere else and committing full time. We've certainly had multiple girls from our area already be drafted and participate in the AFL Women's, which is incredible to see. And we've also seen multiple girls go and play in Victoria League or alternatively even become potentially training partners for Suncorp Super Netball and those sorts of areas. So, I mean, it's it's no different to anyone who does play multiple sports growing up. And ultimately, at some point, they often do have to make a decision. But whilst they're local, we want to encourage girls to play as much sport as possible and be involved in as many clubs as possible. I know we wound the clock back with you when we did an ag report with you last week, but we're going to do it again if we went back to 2004 and saw all this kind of money being poured into women's sport it's amazing to think where we might be now and some of the I guess um, I'm not sure scapegoating is the right word but perhaps uh, people in certain circles in uh, a lot a lot of people in the media as well uh, tend to sort of paint the AFLW as being of a substandard level uh, you wouldn't have any of that, I'd imagine, if um, you know the developmental pathways were stronger 20 years ago. I think it's really important to acknowledge as well that the difference in style of play too, the women's AFL and the men's AFL play very differently. And for me, it comes down to any code of sport. Instead of comparing one with the other, we should just appreciate the uniqueness and the talent that's involved in both leagues. There are so many girls when the AFL women's was started that cross from other leagues, from basketball, from netball, from athletics from a variety of different backgrounds and step straight into elite football as well. I mean, to me, that is a sublime athlete. And it is it is fantastic to see how much money is being put into women's sport now. It's difficult to correlate what might have been if the money had put in, been put in earlier. But the important thing for us to focus on is that they are doing it now. It's a really heavy focus and it's shown great benefits in grassroots communities and it's important that we continue to do it. And to be fair, I'm not even sure a lot of these people commenting or actually watching the games it's often just the element of the low scoring that seems to trigger people Amy yeah I don't read too much into the comments that often get said I tend to just watch the sport and enjoy it but you know when you look back a hundred years ago at the scoring for the AFL it's potentially not as high scoring as what you see today in the AFL as well so every competition has to start from somewhere the girls will only get better and I'm sure in 40 or 50 years time it won't even be thought about again there we go I think you've uh sum that up very nicely indeed. Let's focus on some netball in your neck of the woods. Going back to Saturday the 1st of June last weekend we had Osborne getting a decent win over Lockhart. Lockhart They'll be pretty happy with how they performed here, given the final score, 72-38, to 38, the final result. Amy, not a disgraceful effort at all from the visitors. Certainly. Both teams came out of the block firing, and it was a really consistent game from Osden. They utilised the full court structure to their advantage. Lockhart, unfortunately, was slightly inaccurate in front of the goals in the first quarter, but once that was sorted out, the, the game changed and it was extremely competitive. Game pl- game flow from both teams was beautiful and overall, I think they'll both be really pleased with their efforts. Osden's best on work, Grace Kennedy and Emily McPherson and Lockhart's were Maddie Robinson and Tegan Hannon. All right, we called a close one between CDHBU and Colt Can and that was indeed the final outcome. 34-40 to 40 in favour of Colt Can. They'll be very happy to get a result. Uh, CDHBU letting it slip, but uh, a good game. Netball perhaps the winner in the end in this one, Amy. Absolutely. Great to see Colt Can get their first win for the season. I'm absolutely stoked for the girls. On the opposite side of that, it is a tough break for CDHBU, but no doubt with their improvements that we've already seen, it will see them hopefully topple someone in the back half of the season. CDHBU was stoked to welcome back Lily Hanrahan onto the court and they fought hard all game. The young Colcan side will be absolutely stoked with their first win. It's a welcome confidence boost for them and no doubt many celebrations and a lot of confidence gained by the girls. CDHBU's best on were Lily Hanrahan, Bridie Laver, Shelby Richardson and Neve Laver and I don't have Colcans unfortunately. Ginger are doing it easy over the Murray Magpies but they're always going to in the end uh, I guess Mar- Murray Magpies getting another experience under their belt in order to better themselves and hopefully 
hopefully improve. Uh, 86 to 17, the final result in this one. A tough game for the young Magpies side against the current ladder leaders. Magpies, as we've talked about, had a great winning streak. Which unfortunately, um, they've caught a little bit of a bigger margin here and haven't been able to convert the game into their favour. Magpies had some great passages of play and unfortunately, they just couldn't convert the centre passes and turnovers into goals. And that's where Jindra probably ran away with it. Jindra put in a solid four-quarter effort across the board. They'll be happy with their performance. Jindra's best on was Sarah Krause and Magpies were Lauren Francis and Alicia Schubert. Now, we called the Holbrook-Henty affair to be the standout game this weekend. Often we get confident in regional sport and make a call like that and we get a big surprise, but we did not get that because this was indeed a thriller. Holbrook 34, Henty 38, the final result. Would have been a great game, Amy. Absolutely. The game of the round certainly delivered. I did say I wouldn't be surprised if Henty picked Holbrook. They've certainly showed they are a force in the league this year and not to be underestimated by anyone. So really great to see those competitive games this this time in the year. Henty stuck to their game plan and in the last quarter... After going goal for goal for the whole game, they could extend their lead. It was a whole team effort. Holbrook, no doubt, will be disappointed with the loss, but really pleased with remaining competitive and pushing for the whole game. I'm sure they've taken plenty of lessons out of this and will look to improve next time. I don't have Holbrook's best on, but Henty was Chelsea Wetton and Holly Kidding. The Giants travelling to Brocklesby absolutely nailed the Saints 45-22. to Good performance and result, Amy, this for the Giants? Certainly. This was a really enjoyable game for a couple of reasons. It was clean. It was highly skilled. Both teams played in great spirit. And importantly, it was in support of a really good cause for the MND round. It was a fantastic day out there. The first half of the game was extremely tight before Giants pulled away in the second half. So they'll be really happy with their ability to put the foot down. And no doubt Saints will be happy with their ability to remain competitive and look to putting that into a four-quarter effort. Saints' best on was Tamara Luria. Giants' was Izzy Kruitsberger. Final game of the round was how long v Billabong Crows, and there wasn't that much in it, but how long emerged victorious 61 at home to Billabong Crows' 47. Yeah, a great win for how long against Sullivan Crows. It was a strong four quarters for how long with the attack and strong driving and feeding alongside their solid defense down the other end, seeing them come away with the win. As we've talked about, Sullivan Crows, unfortunately, have been battling a lot of injuries, but they will be stoked to be able to start getting a few girls back and really remaining competitive and pushing top sides to try and fight for their place in finals as well, which we know is going to be a really tight race. How long's best on were Lily Smith and Kirby McDonald and Crows? were Georgia Wilson, Ricky Robb and Felice Steele. Amy Riley, our correspondent out of Hume Netball. Thanks so much for your time. Great to catch up again with a slightly different angle this week. We'll see you again next week. Enjoy the break. Thanks so much. We'll catch up then.